Hello and welcome to the Back to Being podcast, where I speak with experts, practitioners and everyday people about living a more healthy, active and mindful life. My name is Kareem Rushdie and I've spent over a decade learning to transform my own chronic pain and stress so I can lead a life worth living. Now I'm using what I've learned along the way, as well as the knowledge and experience of my guests to share unique perspectives that can help you do the same. Thank you for tuning in today. Today I'm speaking with behavioral scientist turned life coach, poet and podcaster, Dr. Jeremy Goldberg. Jeremy's on a mission to make kindness cool, empathy popular and compassion commonplace. Since leaving academia and research behind and founding long distance love bombs, Jeremy has used his expertise in human behavior and his knowledge of how the brain influences our actions to help countless clients, listeners, and readers of his work cultivate more kindness and compassion for others and themselves. This was a special podcast as Jeremy happened to be passing through Edinburgh, so we were able to record in person, a rare luxury these days. We talk about a whole host of topics related to why we behave the way we do and how to overcome common barriers to making positive changes in our lives. I found this a really enriching, enlightening, and fun conversation, and I hope you do too. Welcome, Jeremy. Welcome to Edinburgh. Welcome to my house, my bedroom, actually. We'll come on to that in a moment. And welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, pleasure, man. I've never recorded a podcast in someone's bedroom before. Well, the backstory to this is I'm in a 150-year-old Victorian house with, you know, 20-foot high ceilings and... I tried to set it up in the living room, but the echo was just crazy. So this room's carpeted. We got the bed absorbing some of the sound waves. So yeah, I think it'll work out well. Yeah, man. Let's do it. It is. Uh, It's cozy. I also want to thank you for last night. So yesterday I was at a workshop with Jeremy and Traver. It was a really special time. I learned a lot and listened a lot, which is different for me. My (laughs) wife instructed me to do. So thank you for that too. Yeah, Yeah, pleasure, man. So we're going to get into a bunch of stuff. I mean, you're an expert in behavioral change and you're on a mission to make kindness cool and compassion commonplace. It just flows, right? It does. Kindness cool and compassion commonplace. So look, I want to start there. Yeah. This implies that kindness is not cool in our world, in our society. It implies that compassion is not commonplace. Why do you think that is? And and, and why did you start Long Distance Love Bombs? We got a one. Yeah. Yeah. Where do I start? So I am a compassion cultivating day making change agent. Love it. And I started a brand called Long Distance Love Bombs when I was doing my PhD thesis on the side to distract me and as a bit of a money maker on the side. Like I was selling little trinkets at the night markets and the arts and crafts markets in town and I'd make, you know, a hundred bucks and that was enough to buy some beer and take my girlfriend out for dinner once a month. And then it just became this thing that spread and the words I was sharing resonated. People were sharing them, following me, telling me how much impact it had. I gave a TED talk called What If Kindness Was Cool. Yep. Great talk. Check it out if you haven't read it. Yeah, thanks, man. And and things just sort of snowballed. But when I began, it was just that umbrella idea or dream. Like, what if kindness was cool? Because you see it everywhere. And we teach our children to be kind and to be compassionate. And anybody that would be listening to this or that you would talk to in real life, they would say, but kindness is cool. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, I know. And you know, and we all know that. But do we really know that at a cultural and societal level? I think that we all recognize it's an important value, but there are many values that get prioritized ahead of that one, particularly at global scale. And for me, yeah, I'm just trying to spread the spread the vibe. And I started doing it as more like fortune cookie style mantras and messages that are encouraging and inspiring and chin up and silver linings and all of that. And through my research, doing my PhD, I learned a lot about behavior change. I learned a lot about how we change our habits and patterns and the role that our mental landscape plays in that. And so then I adapted that science analytical background, smushed it together with some profanity and entertainment and my own experiences and have been communicating personal development from an individual context with the idea that it's very difficult to love the world if you hate yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to be kind and patient to your friends, your family, your children. If you are unkind to yourself, if you bully yourself, if you don't have compassion for who you are. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. 
is about trying to share what I've learned to help people believe in themselves, get clarity about who they are, why they are the way they are, what they want, and then live lives that sort of embody those ideas. And then to choose habits, people, actions that align with that path of integrity and clarity that they have discovered deep down. You mentioned there you kind of smushed together the kindness and compassion promotion with the PhD you were doing. Mm -hmm. Where do they intersect when you talk about behavioral change, right? I mean, is kindness to self, self-compassion, are they a factor when it comes to changing behaviors, changing habits? Yeah, I think that, how deep do we want to go down the rabbit hole? Go deep. Go yeah, deep. I, think, go deep. I think part of what I've seen is when I work with clients or when I teach workshops, et cetera, people have, and I've been putting myself in this bucket also, and like, I am not a guru. I've got a whole bunch of shit and issues in my own blind spots for sure. But I've learned oftentimes the hard way that when I have resistance to something, when I have resistance to feeling a certain way, when I have resistance to how reality is occurring in my life, when I have resistance to how someone is behaving or something that's happened in the news, like when I have resistance to that, I'm operating in this space that can sometimes appear as angry, gruff, critical, unloving, mm. mean. The world should be this way. They shouldn't have done that. They're an asshole. Or why am I feeling this way? I'm broken. I'm bad. I'm an idiot. And so oftentimes what I try to convey or communicate is that it's like piling things on. It's like a shit sandwich, right? So you have like this judgment or this critical part or this resistance. And then on top of that, we add shame, judgment, cruelty, comparison, et cetera. Yep. And that doesn't actually change the original issue. And so part of the work then becomes loving and embracing what is, right? And so that requires kindness and compassion to self yep. of, hey, I know that I noticed or I'm building this awareness of how I'm talking to myself. I'm building this awareness of who I am, right? And some of that is difficult to face. You know, we look at our shadow self, the parts of ourselves that we try to hide from the world, the parts of ourselves that we don't really mm, look at very often, right? And so kindness and compassion is required to not only turn into that space and face it, but to actually bring it close and stare it in the eyes and, and hold it with reverence because it has helped us become who we are currently. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And I want to come back to, you know, one of the, while you're talking, I'm thinking about, because, you know, back to being initially was all around working with pain, changing relationship with chronic pain, specifically for low back, because that's what I'd experienced myself. But many people have said, that, you know, the principles in the course can be applied to any kind of pain, maybe not some of the body work, because that's very specific to the lower back, but mm -hmm. it all starts with this foundation of mindfulness and building that as a stable base, mm -hmm. because, you know, core attitudes or foundational attitudes of mindfulness are compassion, kindness to self, patience, non-striving, non-judging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is so hard to do when you're in pain because you have a very antagonistic relationship with your body, with yourself. You start to hate, you know, first your body and then yourself because you're constantly asking what is wrong with me. So I want to come back to that a little bit later. But when it comes to breaking you know, not being compassionate to yourself, not being kind to yourself, they are habits in and of themselves, right? And that's their habitual ways of thinking, those kind of well-worn mental grooves of self-loathing. And that second layer you talk about, it reminds me of the parable of the two arrows. Life shoots arrows at us, which are inescapable part of the human condition. We get old, we get sick, we lose people, we grieve, but then we layer on top of that the worry, the fear, the self-loathing. And those second arrows are really, you said it doesn't really change the situation, I go one step further, it makes the situation so much worse, right? I mean, it blows the situation up that if you could accept it and let's see what it was, you're in a much better position to change it. As I'm hearing you and even talking now, I'm seeing that strong connection between breaking those habits and it's starting with being kind to yourself and compassionate to yourself. Yeah, I hear that often when I'm working with clients, I'm often chiming in and interrupting them and saying, did you notice the power of your words there? Right. Right. I have a problem where I... I'm problematic or I'm bad or I'm shit at this or I'm angry. Like you're not. I should have done better. I should have done better. And it's like, hang on, let's be gentle. And 
Well, you're not angry, you're feeling anger. There are no, many parts of you. You contain multitudes. It's like there's a piece of you that feels or is experiencing the sensation of anger right now. And as pedantic and small as that might seem, it's actually a huge difference of the way that you identify who you are. We talked about this last night. Yep. Identity, right? And so for me, I'm big on just called it the A team. It was like this 80s TV show with this big guy. Yeah, Mr. Was Mr. T. Man. Yeah. So, like in one of my courses, I call it the A team, which is awareness, acceptance, action. And so it's a very simplistic way of looking at the world and trying to change your life is first cultivating an awareness of who you are, mm-hmm. how you think, what you believe, how you show up in the world. And again, that relates to some of what I mentioned previously about taking a good long look in the mirror at your shadow, at the stuff you don't want to admit, the reality you don't want to face. That's the awareness piece. And then it becomes acceptance, which is where I think the kindness and compassion component has to occur. It's like, okay, sometimes I lose my temper. You know, I cheated on my wife or, you know, I was addicted to drugs for 20 years or I have this pattern, I have this behavior. And so you're being gentle and you're offering yourself grace through that journey for the reasons we talked about before. It's like, it doesn't help. It doesn't change reality to shit all over yourself. But rather, if you can turn and face that reality with honesty and compassion, it's very difficult. Like, this stuff's not easy. And I think that's one point I'm trying to communicate also to people is kindness is, it's rare at scale, I think, because it is so difficult to see yourself in the other, to pause, to bite your tongue, to brainstorm different perspectives or ideas or imaginations Mm. why something might be happening in a certain way. Mm. So this idea of acceptance, okay, growing up, I learned that this is how I should think, or I learned that this is how the world operates. I learned these survival tactics and they became repeated through time and they served me and they became part of my personality. But now, 20 years later, I'm a grown ass man. And some of these things that I learned are juvenile in the past. <laughs> yeah. They're immature. They no longer serve me. I've outgrown who I used to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, I've got the awareness, I've got the acceptance, and then the action, which is like, what am I going to do about it? Right. I don't love as much that I do this thing, or I want to change this pattern, or I want to stop dating assholes, or I want to be kinder. And it's like, okay, what are you going to do? And how do you start making changes? And how do you lean into the discomfort? that inevitably arises from that process, yeah. right? How do you get outside your comfort zone? How do you try something new? How do you suck at something the first time you try it? So so, on awareness, right? So awareness, acceptance, actually, we were just looking at the Thich Nhat Hanh book earlier, recognize, embrace, transform, but it's very silly, actually, right? Recognize is that awareness, embrace it, accept it, it is part of you, and then transform it. That's the action. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's only one truth at the end of the day, right? When you're working with people, when you're talking to people about this three-step plan, how do you advise them to cultivate awareness? What does that take? I think one part in particular is getting outside help. So hiring a therapist, hiring a coach, listening to podcasts, reading books. So trying to get outside the frame of your life, right? It's hard to read the label when you're living in the bottle. It's hard to see the picture when you're Mm -hmm. living in the frame, these kinds of things. So oftentimes we have things that we know we're doing and we can understand those things. But we also have really huge, really sneaky blind spots, which we might not fully appreciate or understand maybe nobody's ever been very honest with us Mm -hmm. and oftentimes as you know i'm sure that in relationship a lot of these things can can come up yeah when you're in an intimate partnership living with someone day to day and they get to know you really well these things get exposed and so i think that's a really powerful way to discover more of who you are and cultivate epiphanies have these little realizations because in my experience When I have that little light bulb moment, it's like, oh my God, I do that thing. I put my face in my hands. I've been on a call with a coach of mine. I remember she was asking me questions and at some point I just paused. I put my head in my hands and I said, I know what you're doing here. I know where you're going with this. And I just went like, oh, I just had this. That moment of awareness. Oh my gosh. Like, how have I not? seen this before yeah. like oh it's been decades and oh my gosh it's totally what's happening and so once that occurs that's the powerful 
breakthrough. And that's a really important moment because how do you then not get into being critical about that thing that yeah. perhaps not so positive side of yourself, your behavior that you've just recognized and still be kind to yourself? The epiphany might be understanding why you do that thing. Yeah. Right. And so the first step would be having an awareness of it. I mean, why is it happening? And awareness that it is occurring. And it's like, oh, that's why I do that. Oh, that's why I date assholes because my dad left as a kid and he taught me that relationships are pain and heartbreak and I've been trying to protect myself. Oh my gosh, that explains it, right? And so the powerful thing though is once you have these insights, you can't unsee it. You can't unknow it. Mm. And so for me, in my experience, like there's no going back. It's like, oh shit. Like now that I really know this in my bones, now that it's a full body understanding, I have to take different actions. Mm. Like I can no longer hide from myself in my life the way that I could previously because I didn't know any better. And that's part of that compassion and kindness piece also is being gentle on who you were in the past. And for me, it was like, I drank a lot. I did a lot of drugs and, you know, got cheated on and committed various actions that I look back on that are very uncomfortable. It was like, oh my gosh, you silly little man. But at the time I was just doing my best. Mm. I didn't know what I know now. Like I didn't have the experiences that I've had now. And so I couldn't take different actions. I literally had no idea that they were bad, right? Or poor or not the best I could. And so I think a huge part of personal development is cultivating that forgiveness for self, for other, being graceful with who you are and who you were, and just being like, dang, okay, that happened. Again, acceptance, like I can't change that. There's no use piling on to 25-year-old Jeremy being like, man, you are a fuck up, man. You drank way too much. I can't believe you did, <laughs> you know, this list of a thousand things, right? It's like, it happened. And all of those, th all of those things brought you to, to where you are today and brought you to sure. the awareness of them. So. Yeah. I, mean, you, I know you work with a lot of people who are experiencing psychological or emotional pain. How about physical pain? I mean, have, you, have you had experience working with people in the same vein who also happen to have some kind of chronic pain condition, like, which is another whole other layer you know, on top yeah. of everything else? Yeah. I don't think I have. Nobody jumps to mind, but if I did, I think I would refer, I'd send them to you, man. Now that I know, now that I know you. But yeah, I mean, I definitely have referred people to other coaches, to, you know, physios, et cetera, because it is holistic, right? And, and going back to what I said earlier, if you, if you hate who you are, it's tough to love the world. Mm. If you hate your body, if you hate your back, if you hate your leg, if you hate your ears, yep. it's very, very difficult to, to love the world or to love your partner. It is. And it's, it's actually very similar, regardless of where the pain or what form the pain takes, psychological, emotional, physical, the stress reaction cycle, which is at this point pretty well researched and written about, the cycle is very similar, right? You have those external or internal stresses. The external would be, you know, bad weather, a fender bender, an argument you have with internal stresses would be things like uncomfortable physical sensations, thoughts and emotions would be internal stresses. Regardless of what the stressor is, the body over 3 million years of evolution responds in the same way, right? We go into a fight or flight mode. It used to be to run away from the bear or to fight the other tribe. You can't now stand up in the office and, and run away or, you know, hit yeah. your boss in the face. So you, you internalize that stress. That energy used to be released through fight or flight. And nowadays, for the most part, it isn't because most of those reactions occur not when we're in mortal danger, but when we're having some kind of, you know, our social standing or our reputation is in danger or some sort of hurt us. We internalize it. That in and of itself has very negative psychological and physical repercussions to it, right? Immune system suppresses, heart rate, you know, blood pressure goes up, all that kind of stuff. And then what I'm kind of getting to in a secure way is we then move towards distractive techniques, right? Maladaptive coping mechanisms or self-destructive coping mechanisms. And in the same way, I'm sure many of the people you work with turn to, they overwork, they overdrink, they overuse drugs, they binge watch Netflix. Exactly the same thing happens with pain. And we use those same techniques. I used them for a long time. Ben and Jerry's was my go-to. But we use those same techniques to momentarily, temporarily distract us from those physical, really uncomfortable physical sensations and the thoughts and emotions around them, knowing deep down that these behaviors are making things worse. 
right? I mean, we know eventually you internalize and you use those maladaptive coping mechanisms for, for long enough and it ends in total breakdown. That's kind of the end of the cycle, total breakdown. I mean, it could be a depressive episode. It could be, you know, serious anxiety or it could be something, even it could be cancer. It could be heart disease, you know, it manifests in that way. So you, you talked earlier about the pause, right? Knowing when to pause. Mindfulness is such a powerful tool to kind of short circuit that stress reaction cycle. You're still going to have the fight or flight response. And Charles Darwin famously, you know, he was very fascinated by this fight or flight response we have. And he used to spend a lot of time at the zoological gardens in the snake enclosure. And he'd go right up to the glass in the snake enclosure and see if when the snake launched itself at him, would he be able to not have that that flinching response. He did this for years, was never able to not have it. I mean, it's hardwired into us, right? Yeah. That, that fight or flight. But what we can do is rather than let it then move to the next step of the cycle, pause, observe the fight or flight for, for what it is, observe that reaction for what it is, and then make a choice, right? How do we respond and how to respond mindfully? How do we respond in a way that allows us to see those thoughts, those emotions, those sensations as impermanent, as fleeting, if we can just be with them? you know, for a while rather than fight with them and, and struggle with them and then end up turning to the bottle or to the pills or, or whatever it may be. So one of the things I want to ask you about is when it comes to behavioral change and the science, this is going back to your academic training, your PhD, I know it's focused on climate change, right? Is what you wrote your, your PhD around, but I'm sure some of what you learned then you're applying now. So I mean, what's the science behind changing behaviors, breaking habitual ways of thinking or doing. I want to get into that a little bit, if you don't mind. And how you apply it now in your work, I think would be really interesting. Yeah, sure. And then just two quick points to what you just said, which I love and agree with, is I've heard this idea of heartfulness rather yep. than mindfulness. Yep. Well, it's actually the same word. So in the Asian languages, heart and mind, they usually use the same term for it. So there's a lot of mindfulness teachers, particularly those with an Eastern kind of training you know, background, they prefer to use the term heartfulness. Yeah. yeah. I just love that as yeah. a word. Yeah. And then secondly was a question that I often will ask people, which I think is a really powerful question, is simply, what are you afraid to feel, right? When you talk about avoiding, distracting, drugs, alcohol, et cetera. It's like, what are you afraid to feel? Mm. And getting really clear on that and diving into that, allowing it, right? Yeah. becomes a really powerful practice. Yeah. So behavior change stuff, there's a lot of it out there. It's obviously a huge topic marketing professionals are really good at it oh yeah there's a lot of facebook google these guys yeah. are behavioral change specialists at the highest level yeah, yeah. exactly but so in terms of the individual actions and habits the, the theory that i utilize for my work that has been utilized for decades across multiple disciplines it's called the theory of planned behavior okay. and it essentially has three areas that are influenced by your underlying beliefs and so if you picture a pyramid, at the base of that pyramid, the foundation is your beliefs, your belief system. Mm -hmm. And then if you picture above that three big chunks, and then at the top of the pyramid is like a very specific action okay. or a specific behavior. And every specific behavior is completely on its own. And so even if they're interrelated, so for example, the reason that you might not go to the gym has a completely separate pyramid to the reason that you don't eat broccoli, even okay. though they're both health related. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you choose a very specific action, such as, you know, I want to, I want to put solar panels on my roof, right? Or I want to. Coming back to the PhD. Yeah. <laughs> the PhD. <laughs> I love you talking about diet, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I want to, I want to start eating better. I know what I'm eating is yeah. screwing with my body. Oh, I want to yeah. cut out processed food or something. Yeah. That's a good example. So I want to eat less processed food. Yeah. Which is inflammatory. Yeah, which, which everybody should do. Hopefully McDonald's isn't sponsoring your podcast. No, they're not. Five guys. So that's it. I want us to have, yeah, I want to stop eating so much processed food. So that's the top, that's the action. Mm -hmm. So underneath that is the three parts of this theory. The first one is attitudes. Second one is what they call social norms, which is essentially the opinion of other people, important people. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is what they term self-efficacy which is essentially your knowledge, skills, abilities, your locus of control. Okay. So your attitudes would be like eating less processed food. Like, what are my attitudes about that? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it hard? Is it fun? Is it terrible? Whatever. Right? So that'd be like, I really enjoy my Doritos and, yeah. I, and I don't want to give them up. And 
Right. Fresh food is more expensive and I don't want to spend that money. I mean, would those be the kind of attitudes? Uh, the we... first one, yes. Okay. The third one about the expense is, is not an attitude. Okay. Right. So that would be in the third one. Okay. So attitudes like good, bad, fine, whatever. Right. Social norms is the opinions of important people. So what does my wife think about me eating less processed food? What does my daughter, what do my closest friends think about me eating less processed food? So in certain cultures, if you replace eating less processed food with, I want to drink less beer, Mm -hmm. you could see how your friends or peer groups we're in scotland so yeah that's not going to go down might well. might be very influential yep even though your attitudes about it would be very supportive okay so eating less processed food feels great feels easy feels fun go to the next one social norms oh man my wife loves processed food all my friends eat processed food. so it's what others are doing right and they need to be people that matter to you right so For this example, if my friend John, who's my closest friend, he teases me and I really don't care about John's opinion, then that's not going to stop me, even though he has a negative. Right. Right. And this might be very random and specific. It might be your neighbor. It might be your boss. It might be whomever. Right. And so your attitude might be negative and that might be stopping you from changing your behavior. The attitudes are good. It might be the important people in your life or your perspective of what their opinions might be, even if you don't know for sure. So I have a story I can tell about my buddy, Kyle, if you remind me that illustrates that. And then the third one is your self-efficacy. So your own abilities, knowledge, skills, money, resources. Do I know how to eat healthier? Do I have the money to buy non-processed food? Do I know how to cook? Do I know how to cook? Do they sell vegetables in this town, et cetera? So you could see it then how you have really good attitudes and everybody in your life supports you, but it's like, I don't know how to cook. I don't know what to eat, right? That might be the thing that is stopping you. Under that, again, is a foundational belief system, which is like, oh, learning new things is hard. I'm not a good cook. I don't follow through with my commitments, right? And so that is like the root step. Like this isn't really going to make a difference. To icky, you know, like, yeah. And then when you even start to interrogate those beliefs, those limiting beliefs, then you go into the onion and then like back out. Mm. Right. And so I find that to be just a very simple transformative framework. They've used that in thousands of studies across everything from getting people to wear their seatbelts to getting psychiatric patients to take their drugs to farmers to everything. Right. And yeah. It's a very simple method. Yeah. And I find that I can just pause and be like, what's going on? Like, Jeremy, I have a little chat with myself. Yeah. Attitudes? Is that other? Yeah, it is. Like, I'm scared what my friend's going to say. I love it. It's like, it's an awareness cultivating exercise in itself. Because as you go through the pyramid, you become aware of what are they? I mean, you might've had those subconscious, those attitudes. What are those attitudes? How do I really feel about what other people think? I mean, all of those are, are expanding that frame of awareness. Yeah, because it's, like it's those difficult things. if you're just like, oh, just cultivate awareness. It's like, okay, well, what do I do? Like, just sit and cultivate awareness. <laughs> like, okay, well, rather than spending an hour in a monastery, it's like attitudes, it's other people, and then my own beliefs about my skills and all self efficacy. And yeah, the, the, like, do I, my... can I pull this off? Do I believe in myself? And so that gives you really specific pragmatic information that you can act upon. It's like, hey, man, I need to change my attitude. Yeah. Or like, I need to fact check my attitude, right? And then the deeper belief is like, I don't want to change. I'm scared to change, right? I'm scared if I change, I'll lose my partner. I'm scared if I change, my friends are going to leave me and I'm going to be lonely. It's fear-based it's stuff, stuff. Yeah. 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 If that deeper belief is true, that might manifest in a negative attitude, of course. That might manifest in mistaken beliefs or opinions about the important people in your life that you don't even know are true or not. Mm. Right. So, so I have this story about my buddy Kyle. Yeah. Right. Years ago, when I started my business, it's called long distance love bombs. There's a big red heart in the logo. I started it anonymously online, a Facebook group. And I was sharing. Why did you start it anonymously? Cause I was terrified. You're the second person I've spoken to that started something yeah. anonymously. I was like, I had a career. I was a scientist. I was a PhD student. I, this is like a fun hobby. I'm a scientist. Don't talk about love. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, man, it's like, I know. It was, this is your creative side. Yeah. It was, you're, you're, you're a side project. Yeah. But 
you know, I'd never really done that in any amount. And so started anonymously. I was posting articles about kindness and love and heartbreak and vulnerability. And I was just starting, right? So I wasn't that good at writing. I wasn't refined. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So it was just easier to start anonymously. And as we said earlier, that stuff was not considered cool, like in the mainstream. Yeah. Just in the mainstream. So at the time I was living in Australia, I was, you know, 28, maybe. How old was I? I was like 31. Anyway, I was a different human. I was drinking a lot. I was playing on soccer teams. I was a PhD student. And I wasn't so far along the path of personal development that I was comfortable being vulnerable. I didn't really know who I was fully, right? So started this side project, started writing this stuff. And then eventually, you know, came out, so to speak. And was like, it's mine. Like, I'm Jeremy. You know, this is my work. And people started learning about it. People that I was friends with. They followed me on Instagram, et cetera. And I was writing these articles. And every time that I would go to post it on Facebook, I would feel this intense Fear and resistance. Yeah. And the mouse would hover over the post button or the publish button. <laughs> You're rereading it. Like, over, over. Yeah. Let me just edit this 15 more times. I'll post it tomorrow. And eventually I started getting curious about that. I was like, what is going on? And, you know, and for whatever reason, I had this guy, Kyle, that I played soccer with, who I was friends with. He was a great guy and a good pal who had never said anything negative about me. I had no idea what he thought about my work, but for whatever reason, it's like those voodoo dolls, right? Where you just have like a representation of a person. And, and I realized that Kyle was like the representation of all of my fear of being judged by society, friends, family, everybody. It was like manifested as Kyle. Interesting. And so it was always like, oh, what's, so you're like, what's Kyle going to think? What's Kyle going to think about this? And like, oh man, like Kyle... Kyle's going to tease me for this one. And like, and, and again, like Kyle had never done any of this, but I had concocted this, Deprecated. Yep. this version of myself, which is this version of Kyle, which is one of those three areas we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. well, they picked up number two. Yeah. The or another. Sexual norms, yeah. And it just became this thing. And so eventually I created this mantra, which I used right before I would post it. And I would say, fuck Kyle. Sorry, Kyle. Sorry, Kyle. I'm like, fuck Kyle. But he represents fuck Kyle. every everything. Yeah. Yes, he yeah. was the representation of all of that, yeah. right? And that was really powerful for me. And this is why I tell this story. Because about a year later, I get this Facebook message from Kyle, the real Kyle, the same exact Kyle. <laughs> and he says, hey, man, I just saw that post that you did. And I was curious if you sell your words like on a canvas because I just moved into this house and there's this big blank wall. I'd love to like print your words out and hang it on my wall. And at this moment, I said, it's about validation. I said, fucking Kyle. <laughs> like, oh my God, I've spent so much time worried about what this fucking guy yeah. thought about my work. Yeah. And it turns out he's a fan. He wants to give me money and support my work. And so it was the complete opposite phenomenon. Yep. And so I share that because I realized the power of this question, which is what if I'm wrong? Mm. And so I think that is a really powerful question to ask yourself often. Yeah. Like, what if I'm wrong? Or uh, Byron Katie's work around, is this true? Like, yeah. Is, is, this, is, is this true? Is, yeah. That, that's what I'm, I'm curious. So that, my wife loves to say worrying is, what does she say? Worrying is dream of your fears coming true, right? And that's, that's exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. I had a similar situation recently where I shared something with someone and that someone represented a larger group. We won't get into this now. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, right? This someone represented a much larger group, a larger community who I had concocted a lot of fears about mm. this thing, or mm -hmm. they say. And they're like, cool. Oh, dang, I've wasted so much time and energy on that. Yeah, right? yeah, and we do. I mean, we're just such an energy suck. The framework is really cool. So uh, one more time. Yeah. For people listening. So you got a habit, something you know, and it could be an action. It could be the eating, the drinking, the taking drugs, whatever. Or it could be a behavior. Or it could even be a way of thinking, but you know that it's not serving you. You know that it's unproductive. Sit down, think about it. What are my attitudes towards it? First mm -hmm. and foremost, or the outcome I'm looking for. Right? I want to stop this way of behavior. I want to stop this way of thinking. What are my attitudes towards that outcome? What are the social norms? And what are people who matter to me think about this 
thing that I want to change? And then what skills do I have at my kind of disposal? Self-efficacy. Yeah. Is you put it? Yeah. In the phrase, knowledge, your ability, yeah. knowledge, ability, skills, and resources. And then finally is belief, which is going deep into where does it kind of stem from? Yeah. I, so, so the way I've rebranded this in my own way, and I've described it as there's like three little shits, which is like those three pillars, like those three little shits are going to stop you. In those three little shits is a big bastard limiting belief. There's like one limiting belief somewhere that's hiding and waiting for you to discover it. And to really explore that, yeah, because that's what's actually going. So for me, in that Kyle example, it was like the belief underneath is like, I'm not good enough to share my words with the world, or I'm not strong enough to to take the criticism. Yeah. yeah. So it was like a self-esteem, self-worth thing, yeah. which is genuinely and generally at at the heart of most of our fears. Yeah. This fear of abandonment, of being ostracized. I want to bring it back to mindfulness a bit because that's something I'm very passionate about. You know, just, uh, learning to teach right now and it was a game changer for me in my journey with chronic pain because those self-limiting beliefs, you know, one of the things that spending time cultivating mindfulness, whether it's through formal meditation or other, there's a lot of ways to do this. At the end of the day, mindfulness is all about re relationality. It's how you relate to yourself, how you relate to the various components of experience, the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations, how you relate to other people, how you relate to the world around you. And I think the issue with self-limiting beliefs is that we're not seeing them as impermanent thoughts. We're seeing them as reality, right? We're identifying with them. There's a, a great psychologist and writer who co-developed mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is highly effective in treating depression and preventing depressive relapses. And he talks about thoughts being, you know, within every thought, there's a kernel of reality, a kernel of truth but surrounded by a shell of inference, right? I mean, we just pile on top of it, all of this stuff and not identifying with those thoughts. I mean, that's how you shadow those self-limiting beliefs. And I think the more you do spend time formally cultivating mindfulness, the more outside of those times of sitting, meditating or doing yoga or mindful movement, whatever it may be, the more equipped you are to see. Because you spend a lot of time when you meditate, at least the form of meditation that I practice, which is kind of insight meditation. So it's very much observing, knowing the mind, training the mind, freeing the mind is kind of the three kind of parts to it. But you spend a lot of time observing those thoughts as they arrive, those thoughts like, I'm not good enough to do this, the self-critical thoughts, et cetera. And then just putting a bit of distance between yourself and the thought and noticing how if you don't latch onto it, it will just pass away in its own time. And all the analogies, you know, clouds in the sky, bubbles in the boiling water, that kind of stuff. But then what I found is outside of the meditation over the years, when those self-limiting beliefs and those thoughts come up, not every time, it's work in progress, but so much more often, I'm able to see them for what they are. And with regard to the pain and changing the relationship with the pain, that was so powerful because the thoughts were really strong and they become my reality. I identify, I was my back pain. You know, this was never going to go away. I'm never going to get my life back. Why did this happen to me? You know, nowadays I ask the question, why wouldn't this happen to me? So much more power. Why is this happening? Well, why wouldn't it happen to you? You know, it's part of the human experience. Pain, loss, grief. I mean, this is just part of being human. Actually, if you go through life without these things happening to you, then you should be asking that question, why aren't these things happening to me? For there, though, the troubling belief at the root of that is that I, I should live a pain-free life. Yeah. Which is like, is that true? No, that's not, not possible. True. No, they're not true. It's not possible. Right. And, you know, I take issue with a lot of the way people dealing with pain and how people work with pain is they talk about, you know, you can live a pain-free life. You can eliminate the pain. You can't do that. It's not about eliminating the pain. It's about changing the way you relate to it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and managing it. The physical sensations, at least in my experience and a lot of, you know, others that I've spoken to who've lived with chronic pain, what causes more suffering is the thoughts and emotions around the sensations, the thoughts and emotions about the sensations. So if you can break, unpack pain down into its constituent elements, physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, and see those for what they are, all impermanent, all fleeting, and even the pain itself. I mean, the times when I was curled up in a ball on the floor, once I decided to meditate on it and slowly over time was able to dip my toes into that pain, get up close, be with it for a while, you notice that it's changing moment by moment. It's changing in intensity. It's changing from sharp to dull. And that is very liberating. It gives you that sense of it's not going to be like this forever. It's changing even as I'm observing it. And the person I interviewed on the podcast, Vidya Mala Birch, put it really well where she said, you know, I don't have to get through this life in pain. I just have to get through the next moment. Mm. 
You know, if you can break it down, it's just really, really powerful. And then seeing those thoughts and emotions as thoughts and emotions is not the truth of things. It was probably the breakthrough for me, at least. So, yeah. And I think that applies to, you know, it's not just pain. And it it applies to self-loathing. It applies to not being kind to yourself, not being compassionate to yourself. Because Mm -hmm. that voice that's speaking at you, putting some distance between you and that voice, realizing that's not you. You're actually the observer of that conversation that you're having with yourself. You are not the person who is either speaking or being spoken to. You can take a step back and sit back and see a little bit. It's powerful too, man, to have a growth mindset versus a stagnated one, right? Yeah. Of, of settling and accepting and saying, woe is me. This is how it's going to be forever. Versus, oh, I've changed countless times in my life and I will continue changing countless times yeah. in my life. And this isn't going to last forever. And as you say, you know, clouds pass and there's always sun behind the clouds no matter where you are. And, yeah. and really trying to practice that imagination or creativity muscle, which it may have been long dormant because you have experienced so much pain or heartache or proof or evidence that the world is a certain way. And to really let yourself imagine and play with the possibility of possibility. Yeah. Possibility, possibility. I like that. And, you know, science and neuroplasticity backs all this up now, right? I mean, you, you think in a different way repeatedly. You're going to carve a new neural pathway. Those old pathways of thinking are going to start to you know, fade away. Those synapses, those connections are going to be weakened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really interesting. I mean, remember, something just popped into my head, which is related, a little bit sidebar, but you know, they've done all these scans of meditators and see how it changes the brain and structures in the brain. And the structures in the brain, which are dedicated or used for self-narrative, so relating everything we experience back to ourself. Right? We are the center of our universe, personalizing everything, selfing, that would be the term that's being used these days. And then there are other structures of the brain which are more related to direct experience, so the experiential, experiencing things as they happen, colors, sights, sounds, tastes, smells, etc. This change happens after a relatively short period. They looked at some people who are doing eight-week programs, mindfulness-based stress reduction and cognitive therapy. And in the brains, let alone people who have meditated for years, the brains of meditators, that self-narrative, those structures, is a lot less activity in them. And in the structures that are around experiential, direct experience of life, much higher. And it's not to say that those meditators never think of themselves. Of course they do. But that coming back to awareness, they're more aware of what mode of mind they're in in any given moment. And they're able to realize that that mode of mind is not serving me and switch out of it and in kind of shifting gears and switch back into experiential mode of mind, being mode of mind rather than doing mode of mind. And that's essentially what it takes, I think, to change the way you relate to experience, to yourself, to pain, physical, emotional, and and psychological. A hundred percent. And all of this is a practice, Yeah. right? It's a dedicated process required day after day after day. And you get better at you selfing, but like lifing. Yeah, be better than and living. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is that, this is that part of me that gets frustrated with. Oh, there it is again. And you start to recognize it and step away. Yeah. Ask some of the questions we've talked about before. Allow yourself to feel things. Another way I've described all of this is sort of building a toolkit, right? And so you have a bigger and bigger toolkit with the more time and devotion that you give to this craft. And it's like, do I need my hammer? Or do I need my meditation practice? Do I need to call a friend? Do I need to move my body? Do I need to do some breath work? Do I need therapy? Right? And so you're more prepared and more experienced when life hands you these situations. Mm -hmm. And you're growing this sense of self-sovereignty to be able to handle yourself in all these different situations. And that, to me, is like how you get better at selfing or lifing or being a husband, being a wife, being a brother, etc. It's the same same idea. You're just committing time and intentionality to being the best you that you can. And I think that that is the game, yeah. right? And it really is a game. It's like there's rules. It's fun. Sometimes the game changes, but individually, we each have our own sort of game to play, and we each have our own version of that game. Yeah. The other thing I've experienced: setbacks are always going to happen. And it's how you respond to those setbacks, you know, rather than seeing it one step forward, two steps back, just flip it around. I'm taking two forward and, and one back. Those setbacks are always going to, you know, going to occur and be kind to yourself when they do. We're going to kind of start to wrap things up. Tell us, you mentioned long distance love bombs. Yeah. Tell us where people can find your work. What are some projects that you're working on at the moment that you're really excited about? I mean, you're in Europe. 
That's yeah, I'm excited. I mean, a Scottish guy's bedroom right now. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> that's never happened. <laughs> With Another your partner in crime who's in my living room. Yeah, Trevor, yeah. yeah, my buddy Trevor Bohm and I are touring around. We were in London. Just did a workshop last night. Every year I run a 10-day, I call it a walking retreat. It's a 200-kilometer walk on the Camino de Santiago in Spain. And so we're going down to Porto tomorrow. And then I'm taking eight people on a journey for 10 days. So I do that every year, which is super fun. Traver and I run an annual retreat over New Year's Eve with our friend Leela Dilla. So we're doing that again over New Year's in the Caribbean, in the Dominican Republic. And there's still spaces for that. We've rented out an entire treehouse village and we have a one week long thing. We go to waterfalls and Leela does breath work and yoga every day. And there's chefs and like it's so fucking awesome. I mean, it sounds like a holiday. Yeah. Oh, there's some theaters yeah, and it, work it's... happening as well. I mean, there's yeah. themes that you guys bring in. Yeah, you know? so we do workshops as well. Oh, and it's personal development and you get to meet a bunch of people. Like people have gotten tattoos to remember the event. Oh. Right? Couples of four, like all the cliche stuff. It's bananas. So that event is just full body lights me up for sure. And then creatively, I've been working on my second book for about a year. I was starting to really make some headway on that. <laughs> a year in. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the, in the, after like 250 pages of writing, I think I finally know what I'm going <laughs> to say. So I'm working on that, which is cool. Can you share a topic? What do you? It's going to be like part autobiography, part shame purge, part personal development guide. Okay. Yeah, sort of like my Instagram account smushed together with a bunch of stories I've never told and don't really want to have to know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't want Kyle to read them. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just a shame purge. Like, but the idea being... Like, this is the book that I needed to read when I was 20 or 25. Okay. I was completely lost or confused. And I haven't seen a book like this written. So mm. I'm like, I'm just going to write the thing and see how it goes. That you can make all those mistakes, do all that stuff, and things you'll come yeah, through it and things, yeah. all, things will work out. Like yeah. the way I've done it, right? Like the defeats and what I've learned and, and all of that. So that's happening. Got a podcast, a long distance love bombs podcast. Yes, check it out. Yeah, 170 episodes. Just cool. it's crazy, man. I think you're my fifth. Crazy. I think you're my fifth one, and I've already got fatigue. <laughs> like, how do you do 170? Oh, I originally I just wanted to do 10 because I was listening to Tim Ferriss, who's a really famous yep. podcaster. He said, you know, don't ever commit to one. If you start something new, commit to like, I think he says six or eight. I just chose 10. And the idea is, if you try one and it sucks, you'll quit. Mm. If you try 10, you'll get over that beginner's hump. You'll actually know what it's like. So yeah, I did 10 and then it just like kept rolling, man. And I just loved it. And suddenly it was like, no, I've done 20. This is crazy. And there's a hundred. I'm like, whoa, a lot of people listening to this now. This is cool. And, and you're talking about a lot of the things we talked about today, but it was a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Yeah. Like I've interviewed New York Times bestsellers and Leah Grimes, like the Grammy winner. <laughs> I hit her up on Instagram and she's like, I listen to your podcast. I'd love to be on. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. You know who I, well, okay. So yeah, it's fun, man. A lot of coaches, therapists, personal development stuff. And you're coaching too. You do one-on-one -on -one coaching. People can reach out I to do. you. At the moment, I'm doing primarily group coaching. Okay. So I have a group coaching program called Bonfire that I just launched that I'll be doing again in probably two or three months. And that's a six-month program that I take people on a journey. There's guest experts. And then there's daily access via this app called Marco Polo. Okay. So it's like one-on-one -on -one coaching. There's group text. It's rad, man. It's just like a smorgasbord of support. For life. Full holistic uh, program. Yeah. Yeah. So you get access to me literally in your pocket every day. You're like, yo, question for you. And I'm like, I got your back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Six <laughs> years to reply. You got to spit some fucking fire you real quick. Because we talked about this shit. Yeah, so I'm doing that. And uh, yeah, speaking here and there, writing on Instagram and, and Facebook. Yeah, that's the main stuff for sure. So before I let you go, one of, there's been kind of a common thread. I can't remember if it came up yesterday in the workshop. We might have touched on it. There's been a common thread with several of the people I've spoken to. I said you're my fifth, maybe my sixth or seventh, and I'm only going to speak to a couple more, at least in this. Because they all been block. in your bedroom also. On screen only. <laughs> yeah, you're sure the first one who's been in. This is like next level intimacy. No, one of the common themes that's come up is like the, the curative properties of service. And we did talk about it yesterday because we talked about how, you know, I, I didn't have any social media accounts before I started the thing. No Facebook, no Instagram, nothing. And still today, it's my wife that manages those, most of those. But I didn't like the idea of being self-promotional. 
But what I've come to kind of realize is that if the intention is to serve and is to help, it kind of changes, it reframes everything. And I think you said it yesterday, withholding yeah. that information, withholding that kind of advice, that life experience that you have is contributing to more suffering yeah. in, in the world. So have you found that being on this journey, just helping others, just serving others has done you some good? I mean, how has that changed your mind? Yeah. I mean, in what, in what way? Yeah. It, in countless ways, like I don't even know where to start, but at a very surface level, like getting the emails and the messages from people, like you've changed my life or you, you've saved my life. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's get, get goosebumps. It's like, what, how, how do you possibly quantify or qualify receiving a message like that about mm. the work that you've done? And, and people mean it. I've been asked to officiate people's weddings. I've had just crazy opportunities and, you know, meeting you as an example, like going to a country I've never been to, mm -hmm. and then people just come and show up to like meet me and listen to me talk and share space and like become friends. And I've met countless, countless friends, all of the closest people in my life. I've pretty much met on Instagram as a consequence of me putting my work and my heart on the internet. I've met my girlfriend on Instagram, mm -hmm. the person I live with now and love so dearly. She and I met because she shared a post of mine and tagged me in it and said, I'm loving this human right now. And I was like, who's this? Hey, pretty lady, <laughs> you know, but like legit, like I met my partner yeah. as a consequence of that. How do you, how do you possibly put a value on that? So kindness is cool. Kindness is cool. Yeah. 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 And none of that would have happened if I didn't, you know, overcome the fear of Kyle but yeah, like my whole, we did talk about this. I was a scientist for a decade that had a career trajectory. I've mm -hmm. published a dozen scientific articles. Like, this is our climate and behavior. Yeah, yeah, behavior change and coral reefs. I worked for the Australian government. I lived in the South Pacific. Like I was a legit scientist. Yeah. And I walked away from all of that because I didn't feel called to that life anymore. And so I've gone on this path uh, very intentionally and with a tremendous amount of trepidation. And a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And so I've had a lot of lessons, man. And it been shaped very much by by throwing myself into the deep end of an entirely new industry and committing to personal development. And a very peculiar thing happens when you start a brand and work as a solo entrepreneur on the internet is you are the brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I Oh, I'm the kindness guy. Like I can't be an asshole. Yep. I have to be very intentional about how I show up in the world. And like, I have raised my bar of integrity so much as a consequence of this work. Yep. Yep. Strategically from a business perspective, but also like seeing the byproducts. Walking the tour. Yep. And that's been super cool and surprising. I never thought that that's what would happen. Yeah. It just started, like, I was just leaving notes for people like, Hey, it's but that's it. I mean, the intention was pure. The authenticity was there yeah. from day one. You weren't slanging something that you I didn't know. believe in, you know, but even on the science side, I think being involved in, in climate and, and that, you know, there's an element of service there. You had that purpose and passion yeah. in the previous career. Yeah. I wrote on my journal years ago that hearts changed their minds. It was like, that was it for me. Like my heart was just like, you're not a scientist anymore, bro. Mm. And I was like, I had my head turned by this mistress of long distance love bombs. And mm. I realized like, oh, that's actually why I'm here. Like I could be a capable scientist. I was a capable scientist. I was good. Could have had the government job forever, but it's like not what I'm supposed to be doing. But that served a purpose. Must have done it. Yeah. I mean, your training, the way you think, yeah. the way you analyze. I mean, that's all kind of applying that now is making you more effective at, at what you do today. Yes. So, so it's like. Those identities. I mean, the Jeremy, the scientist, is such a important yeah. part of you. Right? Yeah, I've got a doctor on my Instagram. Love that. That's how I use <laughs> it. <laughs> that adds, right. adds a whole level of credibility. Like, you're so. What is it? Like, oh, you're so egotistical to have that. I'm like, I fucking earned that. I got a PhD. James <laughs> yeah. in that document. I'm. It's the only way I could use it. Put it on my soul. I words like 20,000 words of PhD. I mean, it's crazy. It's longer, man. It was a research and years. Yeah, five years it took. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, if someone's done a PhD, then they can tell you you're being an egotistical doctor on that. Yeah, and they won't. 
Because <laughs> they knew. They will go talk to him. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like once I wrote a book, and then it's like, oh, it's very difficult to criticize a book now. Mm-hmm. Like someone that's made it, got it done, yeah. got it printed. It's yeah. like respect. Yeah. It was like, Regardless of the content, just the process, the effort. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, Navy SEALs, I imagine, don't go around criticizing Navy SEALs. It's mm-hmm. like, you made it through, like, there's a certain amount of respect, yeah. right? And, like, reverence for the process. Yeah. So, anyway, brother, thank cool. you. Cool, yeah, let's wrap things up. Thank Appreciate you, Jeremy. It. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. I'm going to have there. you back. I'm going to have you back for sure. Yeah. In your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Come out to Canada. I'll host. Thank you, Jeremy. No, of course. But thanks for listening, guys. Thanks again for listening to the Back to Being podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to receive news about future shows. If you're struggling with lower back pain and the distress it can cause, then check out the Back to Being method, a 10-week program based on my own lived experience designed to help you transform your relationship with lower back pain so you can live a healthier, more active, and mindful life. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others. I wish you well.